Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the mind virus. My guest is my friend Paul Levy. He is the author of Awakened by Darkness, Dispelling Watiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil, The Quantum Revelation, and Watiko, Healing the Mind Virus that Plagues the World. Paul is based in the Portland, Oregon area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. I'm just so happy to be here with you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're very welcome. You have an important topic to talk about, and even more important as time goes by, it seems. And, and yet there's an irony in that this mind virus, this Watiko, as, as you have labeled it, it seems to be getting worse and worse, and yet at the same time, it's always been there, and I suspect maybe always will be. Yeah, that's true. You know, one of the jokes I make with my friends that if I had like this, this marketing department, they couldn't have done anything better than creating the events of the last two years to publicize my work on the Watiko Mind Virus. You know, because what's happening in the pandemic, I mean, really, it is the Watiko Mind Virus that's informing and giving shape to what's happening in the world. And you're totally right. It's been with us since time immemorial, it exists in the collective unconscious of our species. And at the same time, it's getting more and more amplified, similar to in a dream. If you're not awake to the symbology of the dream, the dream just amplifies the symbols getting more and more intense until we get the message. And I think that's a very simple way of understanding what you know you were saying about how this mind virus is is just getting you know more and more in our face so to speak until we actually have the recognition of what it's revealing to us i think a good place to begin actually is at the very end of your newest book on watiko where you have the the your equivalent of buddha's four noble principles the four principles of, of Watiko, uh, that'll sort of provide a, a really good overview for our viewers. And I should also say, before we get started, that this is not our first interview on the subject. Uh, I think this is maybe our fourth interview. And uh, what I'm going to do right in the upper right hand of the screen is put a link to the previous interviews because I know our viewers will benefit uh, the ones who want to go more deeply into this topic by viewing those as well. Yeah, for sure. So I'm happy. So in the back of the book, based on who's sort of like taking off from the, the, the noble, the four of the noble truths of Buddha. I created sort of in a lighthearted way the four ignoble blindnesses of Watiko, because Watiko is this form of this blindness. It's a psychic blindness. And the first of the four ignoble blindnesses of Watiko is that it's a blindness that doesn't know it's blind. It's oblivious to its blindness. And not only does it not know it's blind, it actually thinks it's sighted. And not only does it think it's sighted, it thinks it's more sighted than people who actually see. So that's the first of the ignoble blindnesses of Watiko. The second of the blindnesses is that when we're afflicted with Watiko, we're blind to our own, to the shadow, to our personal shadow, and we're blind to the archetypal shadow. And then, of course, we, when we're blind to our own shadow, we project it out and we see the shadow outside in others. And so that's really very simply put the second of the ignoble blindnesses. Then the third is not only are we blind to our shadow, we're blind to our own light. We don't see our nature. And um, so that's a simple way of describing the, the third of the blindnesses. The fourth is that Watiko actually is this revelation. And 
when we're afflicted with Watika, we don't recognize it as a revelation. And um, so very simply put, right there are the four blindnesses. There are aspects of the same complex of this mind virus. And um, when we're asleep to this mind virus, we then unwittingly become an instrument and it then can, you know, freely act itself out through us. And all the while, we're just oblivious to, to that. You originally began calling it me. Malignant egophrenia, M-E disease, me disease. That was before I found the name Watiko. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. And and I was just I wrote a whole book about malignant egophrenia, you know, not having the name Watiko. And then when I found Watiko, I I thought, oh, that's a better name. That's sort of a sacred name in Native American indigenous tradition. But you know, it totally it just you know, it's exactly what I was pointing at when I created the, the you know, the M-E disease, me disease, malignant egophrenia. Because think about it, it's the ego that actually is part, you know, it's, it's, it, it's even though it's an illusion, it's, but it's part of the ecology of the psyche, but it's the ego running amok and getting in the driver's seat. And that's just a very superficial way of describing Watiko, because Watiko, it's a very multidimensional, profound idea, but just in a simple term, it had a yeah, simple way. It's like this misidentification of who we think we are when we think that we're just like a skin encapsulated ego to, you know, to quote Alan Watts and that we exist, you know, as this reference point in space and time, then we've created this limited identity. And by the power of our creativity, we're then going to draw all the evidence confirming that that is who we are in a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And then we spend the rest of our lives protecting and defending that identity that's fictitious. It doesn't even exist in the way that we're imagining it does. And and meanwhile, all of our creative energy is getting invested in protecting this, this illusion. And that's, that's madness. And that's a way of describing what Tico. One of the things I really love about your new book is that you go through the world of literature, the world of religion, many other worlds where people in, have their own cultural descriptions of this phenomenon. Uh, in, in the Islamic world, it's referred to as Iblis. In uh, Christianity, one can think of Satan uh, or pure evil. In uh, the work of the uh, great philosopher and uh, writer of fiction, Colin Wilson, it's the mind parasite. Even P.K. Dick refers to it at great length. Yeah, and P.K. Dick, Philip K. Dick calls it the black iron prison. And when I was going through his his work and his journal and his letters, I could not believe when I began to put together his description of this black iron prison. And he was completely pointing at Watiko, you know, in a precise way. And, you know, he so I, I have a major chapter in the book on both the mind parasites of Colin Wilson and then of Philip K. Dick's work on the Black Iron Prison, because what I was trying to point out is that every spiritual tradition from time immemorial and some of the greatest philosophers, thinkers and creative artists, they've all been pointing at this mind virus. But they, they call it a different name and they articulate it creatively based on, you know, their own mind and the time they live in. And what I'm trying to point at is that, oh, isn't it interesting that they're all pointing at the exact same thing? And it's the very thing that we as a species are refusing to look at. And that's why they're pointing at it, because this mind virus only has power over us to the extent that we don't see it, you know, and then it can operate through our blind spots. And so it just was really inspiring to me to find, like you mentioned, Philip K. Dick, you know, um, that he felt, oh, this is this is the, the real, you know, the most important stuff, just like in the Castaneda books. You know, Carlos's teacher, you know, ta he points out that he goes, he's he doesn't have the name Watiko, but he says this is the topic of topics. And the point is, is that we are these creative beings and we can actually articulate the mind virus in our own way to help ourselves to see it and to help other people to see it. Because as more and more of us see it, 
we actually take away its power over us and we become empowered. Well, as a parapsychologist, I have ample evidence, tons and tons of evidence about human potential, that the human mind is not limited by space or time. The human mind can travel anywhere. The human mind can heal. The human mind has so much potential. And yet, as the only recipient of a doctoral diploma that says parapsychology, I know how this information is, is taboo. Socially, it, it can't be discussed in uh, most universities. Even recently, at a scientific conference uh, where I was asked to present, I was told, you know, you can't use this word, you can't say that. People will think it's unscientific. Right, right. Well, that, what you just described, Jeffrey, that's an expression that Watiko is in, in the room. Because one of the ways of knowing when Watiko is, is around is when we can't just speak our truth and be congruent and be authentic. That, oh, if I say this, I'll get criticized. If I'll say that, I'll be judged. If I'll say that, they'll, you know, whatever. And so then what happens, we internalize that voice, that oppression of like, oh, you know, I'm talking about people, you know, like, you know, w whether it's kids or even just, you know, just really anybody in society, we then internalize that inner voice that says, oh, no, you can't say this. You can't say the word parapsychology. You can't so whatever. And then the oppressor, they exit stage left. And then that voice becomes internalized. And then we actually shut ourselves down without even knowing it because it gets pushed into the unconscious and it becomes chronic. And, and the other thing I just want to point out, you are so right on. When I first or it's not when I first discovered what in my own in my own life. But as I was struggling with, you know, my direct encounter with Watiko, and it really, it almost killed me. You know, I, I had this, you know, this unbelievably overwhelming encounter with it, both in my family and then with the mental health system. But then I had an awakening through that encounter. And in the awakening, I connected with what you're talking about, the non-local nature of the mind, the unbelievable, unimaginable creative power of our mind. And as soon as I began to bring that forth in the world, just out of the excitement, then one could say that, well, then, then Watiko in the field made sure to shut me down because, you know, that was so contrary to the scientific materialistic point of view that was prevailing in our world. It's almost as if there is some force that is keeping us from being in touch with our own godlike nature. And as you point out, that is a, a necessary force. Yeah, right. Because I point out that it's not just as if our species is asleep. It's not just that. It's as if there's some sort of negative force that's trying to keep us asleep. And, and I point out in my book that you know, that as best as we can tell, that is an essential ingredient of the cosmos that's actually serving. It's like catalyzing the evolution of our species. So instead of seeing it as like a negative thing, you know, it actually is helping us in a certain way. But if we don't have the recognition of how it's helping us, then it just assumes its programmed role of, of killing us. Yes, it can be very dangerous. Uh, it ultimately, I think, is also related to the whole theological question, probably the biggest problem in all of theology, the origin of evil. Because if, if you say, you know, God is good and God is the creator of everything, then w w why does evil exist at all in the world? Yeah, yeah. And that one of the things about my work that 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 freaks people out, or at least some people, is that I talk about evil, you know, and how come I talk about evil is that I had this direct encounter with evil. And, and that was what precipitated my whole awakening. And um, it wasn't just personal evil, like the personal evil, of the shadow, it was like archetypal evil, you know, the stuff that 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 mythology, you know, really tries to symbolize. And so for a number of decades, I mean, this is, you know, since 1981, I've been in that arena in a way having it out with this evil. 
And what I'm discovering in my own life, not just as a theory or a philosophy, not in an abstract way, but really experientially, that sort of, I would say, encoded in that evil, there's some, it's like the creative spirit is is hidden within that. And there is a way of you know, almost like alchemically transmuting or extracting from that evil this unbelievable creative spirit that's not of our ego. And that, in a sense, is what's informed my whole body of work that I've created out of this direct encounter with evil. So it's really interesting to me when I'll talk about evil or I'll, I'll, I'll write about it, seeing people's reactions against it. And then if I'll try to point that out, you know, the conversation is basically over. But that's really, really interesting to me how a word like evil just has such a charge to it and people have such reactions to it where one of the things I'm pointing out is that it's profoundly important for us that it, that it might actually be helping us or teaching us and to really try to understand what is it about how do we integrate it into the equation of the universe, really. Well, I recently had a conversation with a person who considers themselves a religious uh, traditionalist in the tradition of René uh, Guinon. And uh, we were talking about demons and the various orders of, of diamonds and demons and so on. And, and his attitude when it came to the pure demons, he said, the less said about them, the better. And uh, I wondered about that. Oh, my God. And I would just so disagree because from my point of view, you know, um, Say if there's a demon, whether it's lesser demon, greater demon, you know, whatever, if we we can't, you know, to, you know, to find the name of a demon, just think about in fairy tales or mythology, when you find the name of the offending demon, you take away its power and, and you actually become empowered yourself. And finding the name is symbolic of, of actually seeing it. You, you have it, you see it as an object separate from yourself. You've actually distinguished yourself from it. So I would I would disagree. Um, and and so would so would I think of the collected works. Young himself talks about the incredible importance of actually creating your own demon. In other words, he's talking about active imagination that to objectify these like sort of darker forces, because if you can't see them outside of yourself, you know, as you're a subject and it's an object, then you're unconsciously identified with it. Then it operates through your blind spots. Then the demon is the lens through which you're viewing the world. And then you unwittingly have offered yourself to be an instrument through which it acts itself out. In Anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner refers to these beings, he calls the, the greater and the lesser guardians of the threshold. And my understanding is that when you encounter them in a state of, let us say, active imagination, what you're going to encounter is, you know, the ugliest, most pure example of evil that you can visualize. And you have to go through that, you have to confront that in order to achieve achieve what they call initiation, which I take to be, you know, a higher level of spiritual consciousness. Yeah. Well, what, when you bring up, um, you know, the anthroposophy with, with Steiner, he, I think it's not in this book, but in the next book, because I have another book coming out on Watiko, because it's such an important and profound topic. And I have a whole chapter on his work. And what Steiner is saying is that the most important event of this modern time is, in his words, the incarnation of the etheric Christ. Okay, so he's saying Christ isn't incarnating through a particular man, but through the collective consciousness of humanity. But then he says, before we can accomplish this, we have to encounter radical evil. We have to encounter the beast. And then he goes on to describe that, and he's describing what he go. He's completely describing that, you know, we have to really, in a sense, add consciousness to this darkness that because keep in mind, the thing about this, this, this Watiko mind virus, it gets fed when we look away, when we turn a blind eye. If you remember, it's a form of blindness, you know, and so we're being, in a sense, asked at this time in history. I mean, just with the last couple of years with the pandemic, it's so over the top the collective madness that's playing out and the evil 
that's playing out. And it's clear that we're being asked both individually and as a species to come to terms with something in ourselves. And it's something that's that's dark, but encoded. The whole point of my work is that encoded in that dark is the light. I mean, that's really that's the true light. And since you mentioned Christ consciousness, as I recall, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness in which he confronted Satan, just as Buddha spent, if I recall correctly, 40 days meditating under the Bodhi tree in which he confronted Mara, which would be the, the Buddhist equivalent. Exactly. And, and, you know, just with reference to that, when you study, you know, times of the greatest spiritual, like, awakening times in all of our history, they're all the times where people, or at least one person, the T, whether it's Christ or Buddha, or a number of people, um, were actually shedding light on evil. That that's important, that the times of the greatest awakening in our species history were also the times where we were illuminating darkness. That That's showing us something. You take great inspiration from the Jewish Kabbalistic teachings in, in your new book. I found that very significant, the idea of uh, uh, the tr light trapped inside of darkness. Yeah, yeah. That, when I, when I, so I had, you know, written a book on Watiko, and then I began studying the Kabbalah, and it blew my mind, because what I realized was that, oh my God, the Kabbalah is completely tracking the Watiko mind virus, but they're just articulating it in in such a, you know, an amazingly creative way. And the idea is, is that, you know, this like the evil, which doesn't even have in the Kabbalistic point of view, this ultimate existence, it actually parasitically feeds on and traps the light. And and so so here's the light, which is the real, which is our nature and which is the source of, of you know, our creative power. And then it's like the phantom, this phantom darkness actually imprisons it and feeds off of it. And that so that maps on to that we are these unbelievable creative, you know, powerful beings made in the image of our creator. But to the extent we don't know it, then this mind virus that actually doesn't even have any intrinsic independent existence on its own actually feeds off of our own light and feeds off of our own creativity. And it turns it against us in a way that's killing us. And so the Kabbalah actually is pointing at that encoded, hidden within the real evil, and that it points out that evil is actually this essential component of God, of the cosmos, and that if we didn't, if there wasn't evil, we wouldn't be able to attain our being free, that freedom and evil have like a correspondence that encoded in that darkness is the true light. And that we, as as Kabbalists or alchemists or Gnostics, however you want to describe it, our job is to extract that light that's hidden in the darkness, you know, of the unconscious. And so, just finally, you know, to uh, get a sense of the Kabbalah, when I kind of went really deep into it, it so inspired me because it made me understand I'm a I didn't even know that I was a, a Kabbalist or whatever you call it, and um. You know, and it's such an incredible um, sort of tradition of helping us understand our place in the world, because the idea in the Kabbalah is that we as human beings are playing the role to help to free God in a way. And who is that God? It's nothing external. It's who we are. Well, it raises a lot of deep questions as to why are we here in this physical world at all? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it raises the not only a lot of questions, but like the deepest existential question, like, why are we here and who are we? And it brings to mind the image of like we we have this we play a like this crucial role in the incarnation, you know, and we, in a sense, to the extent that we self reflect and become conscious you know, of ourselves and of our consciousness, we have, we unwittingly or not unwittingly, we then offer ourselves as the vehicle through which God incarnates through us. So we're actually playing a participatory, this role 
in the incarnation of the divine, you know, as just these seemingly limited human beings. And that and that gives us this enormous um, just the sense of people who struggle with, you know, meaning the meaning of life or who are they or anything like that. It creates a context for, no, we have this important, this role to play. And not everybody has to write books or be a teacher or anything like that. No, but just even being a good person who has an open heart and is a conduit for love and compassion, that itself is sufficient. That might be our role in the cosmic drama. One of the insidious features of this mind virus that you describe is that we often fall into a trap. I imagine everybody has been in this trap, or will be if they haven't, of believing that we have now liberated ourselves. Uh, we are now free from some sort of a delusion, only uh, eventually, if we're lucky, to discover that we've uh, fallen into yet another delusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like sort of being in a dream and and having the awareness that you're dreaming and then, you know, that you're dreaming you've woken up and, oh, now I've woken up out of the illusion, out of the dream. But then at a certain point, you invariably have the realization, oh, that itself is just another dream. And yeah, the thing about the mind virus, I mean, it it fools us. It, it's a trickster. And in a way, we we actually trick ourselves out of our own mind. You know, and um, one simple way, if I can just describe, there's like, you know, I think about it like in it's like three facets of how this mind virus kind of captures us. And the first is so like in the apocryphal text of the Bible, they talk about the mind virus. They don't call it that. They call it the 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 count, the spirit, the counterfeiting spirit. And so this counterfeiting spirit, it has no creativity on its own. It'll just impersonate us. And it offers us this this false version of ourselves. But you see, it has no power over us at all as long as we are in touch with our nature. So when we're in touch with who we are, this mind virus has no power over us. But if we then forget who we are for a moment and then the mind virus offers us this this limited version of ourselves. Oh, I'm traumatized. I'm wounded. And we then identify with that with its version. Then it has us. Because then it can manipulate that limited, fictitious identity, and it can control us. Now, take a look what I just described. We actually given ourselves away. We've given ourselves away. We've identified with who we're not, and we disconnected from our creative power. Right there, though, those are the three facets of Watiko. That's the recipe for madness. That's Watiko in a nutshell. And that's what I'm talking about, that that to the extent we're not awake, we are colluding in that process. And my whole work, and, and keep in mind, I'm also, how come I talk about this is to help myself to continually deepen my my awakening, because it's, you know, it can be easy for any of us to fall, you know, to get absorbed in the forms of the dream. Um, but I, I don't want to cast any spells. It's actually, it takes a lot of energy to keep ourselves absorbed and stuck, it's way easier to just have the recognition of our nature. And and that's that's like in a way getting out of our own way and, and letting our light shine. That's easy to do. And so it's not like it's, oh, you have to do this hard, struggling thing to free yourself from Watiko. No, that thought form itself is Watiko, is a form of Watiko. All we need to do is just to like connect with our nature to remember who we are, to embody our love and our compassion and our light, and then Watiko can't touch us. Well, doesn't it seem to you, though, it seems to me that it's everywhere. It's like you can't, you can't really escape from it. It's always touching us at, at some level until you're uh, maybe totally enlightened or out of the body or pure spirit, or as long as we're in this human body, it seems to me that we're, ne we're never very far away from the uh, potential of being deceived yet again. Right, right. No, but I'm so glad to hear you say that because it's, it's this, this non-local energy that pervades all of the multi-dimensions of the universe. And I get really triggered when people, you know, are of the opinion like, oh, I'm free of Watiko or whatever. No, as you know, being these human beings, we're all, you know, we all have to, you know, 
kind of go through this experience together. But the point is, yeah, it's everywhere. And at every moment, potentially, we're encountering the mind virus. But it only had to, you know, the thing, keep in mind, it's not objective. It's not something that exists objectively separate from our own mind. So it only then has power over us if we actually get hooked by it, how if how we react to it. So if we collude with it or not. And what that means is that at each and every moment, we have the opportunity to free ourselves from it or to actually to deepen our understanding of our nature. And the interesting thing is, it's the mind virus that's presenting us with that up with that opportunity to more connect with who we are. So that's beginning to point at that it has a positive aspect that it's actually catalyzing us to awaken. Because if we were already perfectly awakened, uh, there would be no movement, there would be just yeah, Right. You know, like the beginning and the end of time, and we would just be there in a state of OM. And- yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. And, well, you know, I just, just in the last few weeks, I was uh, having, a, you know, like this, this session with a client, and spontaneously, I couldn't believe that I said this, but I, I really, you know, it was true. I said to her, I go, you know, the worst thing I could ever imagine happening is that if there was no Watiko in the world. And she was shocked. She was like, what do you mean? I thought what he goes bad. And I, and I said, well, it's like this. It's like in remember after Christ had with his disciples, the, the last supper. And then I think one, I think Peter or the disciples, they got word that the Romans were coming to arrest Christ. And so I think it was Peter who wanted to hide him so that he wouldn't get arrested. What did Christ say to Peter? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Right. So Peter, thinking he was going to be saving Christ from like getting arrested and getting crucified and all that. No, he was he was an agent of Satan. He because Christ knew, no, this was his destiny to help with the salvation of humanity in the same way. If there is no Watiko in the world, we as a species wouldn't evolve, you know, and that would be the worst thing imaginable. So that's what I'm pointing out, because. In my, and I think in my first book on Watiko, I point out that if Watiko didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. It's that important. And that's super mind blowing to think the very thing that's destroying us, that's the source of the deepest evil, is actually the very thing that's potentially helping us to awaken. You, in effect, say that if it wasn't for the darkness, we wouldn't see the light. If it, if it wasn't for all the lies, we wouldn't be able to distinguish the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. It's that same archetypal dynamic that, you know, this thing that we think of as evil or darkness or lies or whatever, that, you know, if that wasn't there, we wouldn't have the contrast to have the recognition of of light, of our own light, of the truth of who we are. And so what we're circumambulating right now, this is now chemical understanding that, you know, instead of, oh, the evil is bad and light is good and they're opposites. No, when there is a polarized understanding like that, the, the Watiko virus feeds off of polarization, you know, and it gets stronger. But when we have the realization, you know, in alchemy, they talk about to bring the opposites together, the coincidentia positorum. It's that same idea that when you begin to have the realization, wait a second, the the deepest darkness and the greatest light at a certain point are complementary and indistinguishable and turn into each other and actually support each other. That consciousness that sees that, that's an expanded consciousness. And that's the consciousness that Watiko can't touch. Now, it does seem to me that there are, I, I would call it different levels of evil. You refer to all the literature that talks about lies, that Watiko loves the falsehoods and ensnaring people in falsehoods. But then you go on to say, no, murder and genocide. That's really, it seems, uh, what Watiko wants, uh, genocide, but not so much as to destroy everybody because then there would be nobody to feed upon. Every parasite needs to kind of protect its host. 
Right, right. And that's where I'll bring in that uh, the idea of, of it being like this parasite is a perfect metaphor. Because, yeah, a parasite, you know, it gets into its host and then, you know, it'll inspire its host to feed it. So it grows bigger, you know, until it eventually kills the host. But it, it doesn't want to do that too soon. Because if it kills the host too soon, then it suffers the inconvenience of finding having to find a new host. Now, the thing about about evil is that ultimately it destroys everything, including itself. And so that's where if we don't, you know, come to terms like so what I'm pointing out is that the, this mind virus, it's actually this dreamed up phenomena, because one of the ways of seeing what Tico is to have the recognition that we're having a collective dream and that that Watiko is an expression of the dream. It's actually revealing to us the dream. And to the extent that we're unconscious, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if one person's unconscious, they go to sleep at night and they're going to dream up their unconscious, that's going to inform the forms of the dream and the dream will manifest. And it's a function of that one person's unconsciousness. Well, and then you have 8 billion people. And so we're, we're dreaming up this incredible collective psychosis that's a reflection of the part of all of us, of the part in the collective unconscious that's unconscious. And what I'm pointing at, very, it's very simple, is that encoded in that process, there's, it's actually revealing to us our unconsciousness. It's, it's, re it's showing us what we need to know. It's actually helping us to wake up exactly like a dream is. And if you don't get the message from a dream, what happens? Well, then you have a recurring dream and it just gets more and more amplified until you finally get the message. So I'm pointing out that to see so to see this as the dream and to see this as a collective dream, that's one of the ways of dispelling with Tico. But to see this as the dream, you actually begin your consciousness begins to expand and you actually begin to um, to see that there's something reflected in the external world that's playing out that's actually like this mirror for something inside of us. So all of a sudden, I'm pointing out to see the outside and the internal are actually these mirrored reflections of each other. When you begin to see that, well, that's that's to see the dream. Because what is a dream but your inner process just manifesting as the seemingly external dream? And, you know, so and that's helping us to wake up to the dreamlike nature and our place in it. But the inspiration for that whole process was the Watiko mind virus. That's what I'm pointing at. So is it a bad thing or is it working secretly for the light? If we look at the history of culture on our planet, we see in the early part of the 20th century, we had the uh, First World War, which was described by H.G. Wells and others as the war to end all wars. That didn't work out too well. We had followed by the Russian Revolution, followed by the Second World War, followed by the uh, Chinese Re Revolution and the deaths of millions of people through genocide. And, and then you have writers like uh, Steven Pinker coming along and saying, you know, things are getting better now. We, since the second half of the 20th century, we haven't had so many wars. We haven't had genocide so bad. The, the number of people dying is, is, from violence is, is dropping. At the same time, we find ourselves faced with a global pandemic that uh, seems to be mutating as fast as we can come up with cures for it. And we're faced with the potential of uh, global warming and uh, man-made pollution on the planet so that many very serious thinkers are saying that the humankind uh, is still facing the potential of its own self-destruction, even if things seem like they're getting better. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally true. And um, like one way that I think about that, you know, so with the Watiko virus, it when it gets into a psyche, into an individual psyche, in a sense, it's like uh, an immune, like an auto, an autoimmune disease of the psyche, where it turns the psyche against itself, such that it begins to destroy itself until it destroys the person and they die. And that is individual process is getting played out because just remember what Tico, it's an inner disease of the soul that explicates itself 
through the medium of the outside world. It's somehow able to extend itself out in the world and configure world events to reflect back the state of the psyche that's under its thrall. So what I just described, when an individual psyche is actually attacking itself and then to the point where it, it destroys itself, that individual process is literally getting played out writ large and mass on the world stage. But like in that happening on the world stage, it's actually reflecting to us how the Watiko mind virus operates in the world. And I would point out, you know, I mean, I'm aware of Pinker's argument that, oh, things are getting better. And I'm aware of the other point of view of things that have never been worse. And, you know, now we have these incredible weapons of mass destruction that we've never had before, that we could destroy the entire species, you know, with the push of a button and all that. And um, what it makes me think of, it's a known thing in psychology when an individual is right at the edge of their process and, you know, say they're right at the edge of a cliff where they're in the corner and they're double bound and it's a no win and things seem the darkest. Typically, that's the point when you have a dream like that. That's the point where you wake up in the dream and have lucidity. And all of a sudden, you get in touch with a deeper part of your being that you weren't able to access before you were at that edge. And I wonder, and I feel that this is true, that that's what's happening collectively, that we as a species are dreaming ourselves right to the edge of this cliff. And we've been, I imagine, I can easily imagine we've been here a billion times before and we've blown ourselves up and destroyed ourselves. And then, you know, planet Earth or whatever planet will just regenerate, takes billions of years, which in dream time is no time at all. And then here we are back at the same point where we've destroyed ourselves again and again. And are are we going to actually wake up sufficiently to avert destroying ourselves and actually up level and evolve and recognize, oh, my God, we're all like cells in a greater organism. We all depend on each other for our well-being. And we can actually come together because we're all on the same side and help each other. That's what's being offered to us. And quantum physics is, is basically saying that because even if that's like incredibly small, you know, potential, that can actually happen. You know, that's within the realm of possibility. We can literally invoke that world. Well, it would be a wonderful thing. Many people feel it's inevitable that Humankind isn't going to survive. I recall talking to some people about the uh, radioactivity uh, from uh, nuclear uh, weapons and, and the storage of nuclear waste seeping into Lake Mead, which uh, is a water supply that feeds five states in the southwestern United States. And a hundred thousand years from now, the whole uh, lake will be completely radioactive. And I've talked to people who were, whose job it was to, you know, see what what can be done about that. And and their attitude is, uh, well, nothing to worry about really, because the human race isn't going to last that long anyway. With our with the human race, does it have an expiration date or? Is it going to evolve into, you know, the state of being that we won't even be able to recognize right now? Because going back to what you were talking about, about the incredible powers of the mind. So when I was deeply struggling with Watiko in the early 80s and it was creating such incredible suffering and it was like I was an overwhelming trauma. And then I had this life transforming spiritual awakening, you know, and that got me in a lot of trouble because I was so excited that, you know, I immediately got hospitalized and as you know, and diagnosed and, and, you know, I was fortunate to know that I was having an awakening. But one of the things that I'll never forget because it just made such an imprint, you know, in my mind was, oh my God, the primary substance of this world isn't matter but we could say is mind or is consciousness. I mean, that's totally having to do with this being a dream. And, and what that means is that, oh my God, each of us, each one of us have this unimaginable creative power, you know? And I was realizing to the extent that we're not awake to that creative power, then it gets, you know, and then here's Watiko, which has no creativity, but it impersonates us, so it plugs into our own creative spirit, 
and it turns it against us. And so what I'm pointing at is that when any of us actually gets in touch with our nature, with our true nature, and our nature by its very nature is creative, when we get in touch with our nature, we then become creative. We express ourselves creatively. And to the extent that we express ourselves creatively, we more know our nature. It becomes a positive feedback loop that creates light upon light, you know. And what I'm basically pointing at is that for any one person to, you know, to see the dreamlike nature or the quantum nature, there are a lot of ways of saying it, it unlocks the creative spirit within you. And yeah, it'll improve your life a lot just individually. But what happens when a number of us, and this is what's happening, more and more of us are plugging in to our creative nature, to who we are, to this incredible creative agency that all of us have. And when we hook up with each other and get in sync with each other, you know, then we can literally change the dream, this being the dream. And that's to actually consciously participate in our own evolution. And that's what I would say this is all about. All of this, what's happening in the world is like this is the way that we're actually discovering that. And when a person discovers it and you really stabilize that realization and deepen it and connect with other people who are also having the same process, you can actually, you know, it's a phrase I've, I use, we can, we can conspire to co-inspire each other. It's a real conspiracy theory in that the, the, the genius, the collective genius of our species gets activated where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And this is possible. This is exactly, I mean, I've written a book about this is what quantum physics is, is revealing to us. And so that gives me incredible hope because the danger is to get really hooked. It's so convincing that things are so dark and, you know, people get so filled with pessimism. But no, I just want to, I'm trying, you know, here, it's so paradoxical. Here I'm, you know, talking and writing all these books about evil and darkness. And my message is incredibly like filled with light and inspiring hope with people. But a lot of people won't even read my book because they're so freaked out and, and you know, upset by the word evil that they can't even go there. There are so many paradoxes associated with uh, this issue. Uh, one of them is the whole question of the projection of the shadow. Uh, one can feel very self-righteous, and uh, to be honest, I often do uh, feel that way when I look at people of a political party or a country or a religion with which I disagree, and I can say to myself, how deceived are they? What idiots are, are they? And uh, I can feel very smug about myself when uh, when that happens. Right, right. And I'm right with you. I mean, that happens to me. And I, I want to point out, so when we when we have the shadow and, and it gets projected out, you know, the the that is the shadow in action is the projection of the shadow. And that is the psychological dynamic that informs Swatiko. Now, in the collected works, Jung himself calls projection of the shadow, he calls it, it's the lie. Now, who's the liar? But Satan, the devil. So the point is that there's something around projecting the shadow and evil that they're, they're really there's a correspondence there. And the thing, you know, for example, when I'll say that projecting the shadow is the dynamic that underlies Watiko, yeah, so say if I'm not in touch with my own evil, Right. And if I'm in a dream, in a night dream, what what happens? Then it gets projected out. My evil gets projected out into the dreamscape. And then some carrier of my projection, whether it's a person or a group of people, will come into the dream field and they'll be carrying my shadow. They'll be embodying it. And now I have all the evidence I need that the evil is outside of myself. So I become even more fixed in the point of view that I'm just light and the evil is out there. And then when I unfold that that dream, invariably I try to destroy the carrier of my evil. And what is that? That's an externalization. I'm actually acting out in the outer world my internal process that started the whole shadow projection of trying to, to exterminate my own darkness. So I'm actually playing out my inner process out in the world of trying to destroy the evil. And then by doing that, Take a look at what's happened. I've become possessed by the evil I'm trying to destroy. That's Watiko. That's madness, you know? 
And of course, the idea of what Tico is, is if we see somebody who's embodying what Tico, whatever, whether, whether it's a politician or whoever it is, and if we then get triggered and think, you know, self-righteously, oh, they're the ones who are evil and, you know, and I'm not, well, that polarization, that sense of feeling separate, that, oh, you know, and, and they're other, that's fuel for what Tico. But if we then see in them, oh, they're totally taken over by evil at that point or by Watiko, and this is a dream, they're reflecting back that part of me, then all of a sudden you cut through the separation and you actually have this opportunity to even get more insight into the deeper part of your own shadow, and that dispels Watiko. I guess that must be why Christ said, love your enemies. Yeah, yeah. Well, the idea is, you see, the thing about Watiko is that it's, you know, it, it's really this this misidentification of who we think we are. If we think we exist as a separate self, as soon as they're separate, as if, if, as soon as we identify with a separate self, then there's other. As soon as there's other, there's fear. And fear is the fuel for Watiko. But when we see through that imagination, and it's just an imagination that we exist in a way that we don't, i.e. as a separate self, and we have the recognition, oh, wow, we're interconnected, we're interdependent, there is no other. Then all of a sudden, what happened to the fear? Then all of a sudden, compassion spontaneously arises. You know, So when we see that seeming adversary and we have the recognition, they're not separate from me. They're a dream character. They're reflecting back that part of me. Out of that realization comes love and compassion, and that is our nature. And it's hard. I know I wouldn't, uh, uh, if I look into myself and think about the, the people who I identify in the world as, as uh, promoting lies, promoting violence, uh, I struggle with myself to feel love and compassion for them. Yeah, but, but be careful, you know, because we're continually casting spells on ourselves. Like when you said it's hard, and, and I understand what you mean, but, but just as an example, if I say, um, you know, oh, to awaken, to spiritually awaken is hard. Well, by the power of my words, I'm going to invoke a universe that's going to give me all the evidence confirming my point of view that spirit, to spiritually awaken is hard. And um, so I'm just, you know, in a way, cautioning us to be careful of our words because we're, ca we're continually casting spells. I mean, how do you make a word? You, you, you spell it. So the, but what you were saying is that, yeah, invariably the real struggle is against yourself. It's not against the other. It's against, you know, your own self and that darker part of yourself. And to the extent that somebody, you know, takes responsibility for that and, um, you know, and that, you know, and that's really, in a sense, that's the deepest struggle. You know, I think of in the collective works, Jung talks about that the great, how does he say it? He says something like the, you know, coming to terms with the power drive of the shadow, that that's the, the most important or the greatest fight that any of us could have, and that's in within ourselves, you know, and that, and all of a sudden then we're not fighting with other people in the outside world. We're first, you know, really taking responsibility for our own darkness. You're reminding me of the biblical story of Jacob who wrestled with, uh, wrestled with an angel, wrestled with God, and then took upon himself the name Israel, which I understand means one who wrestles with God. Uh, it, it would suggest to me that, you know, engaging in a wrestling match like that isn't a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that myth of Jacob wrestling with the dark angel of God, I talk about that a lot in my work, because one of the questions I ask, how come he was wrestling with the dark angel? You know, that's an interesting question. And the answer is he would have been killed otherwise. Right. So, I mean, that's really important that if we aren't up to the task, you know, then we get destroyed. But then in that myth, it's so symbolic because what happens? He just has to make it till the sun rises. And then as soon as the sun comes, you know, then the angel touches him on the hip and he gets this wound. And that's very symbolic that an encounter with the self, 
with the higher self is this wounding experience. This is Jung. He he really talks about this a lot. And then, yeah, and then the angel changes his name, like you were saying, to Israel. He was wrestled with God, which is symbolic that his nature has been changed via the encounter with the divine, you know. And in a sense, that's all of us, you know, and um, that's what we're all going through. Paul Levy, what a joy to be with you again and uh, to discuss these things. I know we could keep talking forever, it seems. This is a, a, a topic, if we run into each other 10,000 years from now, we could pick it up again. Uh, and I hope we have many, many more conversations. Paul, thank you so much for being with me. It's my pleasure. I mean, I feel the same way. I feel like we could, we're like in a cafe and we could just be talking for like 10 hours about this stuff. It just is so unbelievably, it, it's, it activates the psyche, really. It certainly does. So thank you once again. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. 